You're listening to the Platform Launchers podcast. I'm John Stonge, and it's great to have you with us this week. I always enjoy this time together as we speak about building and growing and monetizing our online platforms. We take our, our passions, we turn them into a platform, and we derive our paychecks from those things. And so it's a lot of fun to be able to do this. I just had a robust conversation with our members club, and I was very entertained, our members club this evening, as uh, I was looking at who is on our live call here, we had just about every region of the United States represented on our call tonight. There wasn't a whole lot of overlap in the states that are represented on the call. We have people in the east, the northeast, the southeast, the Midwest. We have people out in the southwest. And so uh, definitely a lot of fun, a lot of variety on the call here. And we were just talking a second ago about our theme this week. And our theme is this idea of perfectionism and whether or not perfectionism is holding us back. Now, if you're in the process of building something online, so if you're building an online platform or pieces of an online platform, maybe through your podcast or your blog or something of that nature, sometimes there are things that feel like they come very easily. And then other times, we feel stuck. We feel like things aren't moving. And I want to throw out a question here at the start tonight as we talk about this idea of sometimes things being messy, sometimes trying to aim for perfectionism. What keeps us stuck? You know, what keeps us uh, from getting ahead with the development of our online platforms? And in many respects, I believe one of the biggest culprits that keeps us from making good progress is perfectionism. I think we've convinced ourselves that we need to create the perfect product before we launch it out into the world. But here's the thing. That's a waste of time, right? Thinking that you have to create the perfect product, it's a waste of time because there is no perfect product. It doesn't exist, right? In fact, I'm convinced that this issue alone is one of the major problems that's keeping people from gaining traction with what they're building. And instead of just speaking in theory, I want to give you some very real, up close and personal examples of how I've seen this play out. So let me give you one example here. I'm going to keep this anonymous and you'll see why. But not long ago, I received a, a message from a friend of mine who has a platform that it's dedicated to various forms of personal development. He's someone that I consider uh, a very wise person. He has a lot of wisdom. He has a lot of insight. And I also consider him to be a very compassionate person because I noticed that when you bring problems to him, he's not dismissive of other people's problems. And so people really like talking to this guy. And a while back, he started writing a book. And the goal of the book, obviously, was to, to help people with just a variety of issues in life that would be related to that whole concept of personal development. And truth be told, I actually thought that the book would be finished by now. But it's not. It's not finished. And apparently what I've discovered is he stopped writing it because he's working on his book cover. So what do you think about that as a reason to stop writing your book? Because you're working on the book cover. And at this point, he sent me maybe six, maybe seven different iterations of that cover. And he's asked me my opinion on each. And the truth is, every single one of them was fine. There was none of them that stood out to me as being drastically better than the others. They were all fine. I liked each one. I told him I liked each one. But I felt bad as I started noticing what was taking place here because I realized he stuck in a cycle of perfectionism. Because instead of writing valuable content, and again, this is somebody with genuine wisdom. He's not somebody that just has trivial things to say. He's a very wise person. But instead of writing valuable content, he feels like he can't move forward until he gets that cover perfected. And I look at that and I think, you know, that's a shame, right? So so while he tinkers with what I would consider inconsequential details about a cover, there's no book for anyone to read because he stopped writing it. It doesn't exist. There's no book. He stopped putting pen to paper. He stopped typing. And I'm starting to wonder, and I, I hope I'm wrong here, but I'm starting to wonder if he's ever going to finish that book and if he's ever going to even be able to use that cover. You know, I have this I have this thought that if this cycle doesn't end, he's going to have the perfect cover that goes to nothing. 
And so I, I'm concerned about that, but that's an example of perfectionism derailing someone from their ultimate goal. His ultimate goal isn't to design the perfect cover. His ultimate goal is to put together a helpful book, and I'm convinced that it will be helpful when he gets it out there. But if he stays stuck on the cover, he's not going to get there. I think a better approach would be write the book, finish writing it, then release it with whichever cover he likes best at the time of publishing. And then if he comes up with a better idea down the road, you, you could just change the cover and update it at any time you want, especially in this world of self-publishing. You could do that very, very quickly. But I don't think he'll do that. And the reason I don't think he'll do that is because I think to him that feels too messy. And he can't stand the thought of releasing anything less than perfect. And by the way, his, per his perception of what's perfect, that's a very arbitrary standard. It's very subjective. Your perspective on what's perfect is very arbitrary and subjective. Same with mine, right? It's very arbitrary. Uh, in the meantime, let me give you some contrast to this. I have another friend who has a background in social work, and it's so like social work and counseling. She does both. And about two years ago, she decided that she wanted to open up her own practice that would help her clients um, in a variety of ways. And it would also, if she if she opened up this practice, she would also um, help her, 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 her gain some online clients because she was doing most of this in face-to-face -face meetings. And she wanted to build up a practice that allowed her to do more virtual counseling sessions with, with people that were from different parts of the country, maybe even different parts of the world. Now, to do that, obviously, she would need a website and a web presence. And she admitted to me she has no experience developing websites. And she also has three young children at home. She and her husband, they have three young children at home. Those children need their attention. And she admitted to me that she really did not know what she was doing in the online space, but she believed that if she could take her practice online, that that would help her serve more people while also being more available for her children. And so it was definitely a goal. And she had that personal tug on her heart to help make this happen. And so we sat down one afternoon and we just did this online and via the phone. And she asked me to run her through the basics of building a website. And we built the website with Squarespace. It wasn't anything complicated. I think Squarespace is a wonderful place if you're if you're trying to figure out how to how to build a website from scratch, but you're not super techie. So she asked me to run her through the basics of doing that. I talked her through it. And I think she dedicated, if I if I remember right, I think she dedicated about two days to creating the website and filling it with content that she thought would be useful for people accessing it. And as I looked at the finished product, I thought, you know, what? it's a nice enough website. It looks professional. It looks good. But it certainly isn't the best site I've ever seen. I've seen sites that are certainly better than that. And in fact, as I scanned through it, I actually found a few errors that will probably be worth fixing, just some like typos and things like that, that if she ever gets around to fixing, it'd probably be worth doing. But obviously, it's not necessary. And sometimes I think maybe she won't ever get around to doing it because I don't think she really thinks that it matters because I spoke to her this week. And right now she has more counseling clients than she knows what to do with. And what's happening is she's got the website up. She started serving people and that the combination of the website and word of mouth from serving customers is uh, continuing to build word of her practice. Her practice continues to grow. More and more people are booking appointments. And keep in mind, they're booking these appointments through her less than perfect website. The website is adequate. The website is fine. It doesn't look like garbage. It doesn't look, um, you know, embarrassing or anything like that, but it's, it's definitely not perfect. And it's definitely not the fanciest website you've ever seen, but it's, it's effective. And so what's the lesson for us here? Why am I bringing up these examples? And by the way, I have a couple other examples I'm going to share with us in just a moment, but what's the, what's the lesson? What should we be taking from these examples? Well, I think that the lesson could be summed up in an old adage, and you've probably heard this before, but perfect is the enemy of done. Do you ever hear that, that phrase? Perfect is the enemy of done. Meaning if we are afraid to launch a product because it's still a little messy or still a little rough around the ages, or, you know, like the, the edges, not ages, I'm just making up words now, apparently. So I'm going to be messy even in this podcast as I fumble over my words. And in the theme of not being a perfectionist, I'm not even going to edit that mistake out of our podcast recording. But the truth is, if we're afraid 
to launch a messy product. It may mean we never launch anything at all. You know, if it's not messy in some respect it, and 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 we just think that it has to be perfect for it to be able to see the light of day, if that's our mindset, we may never launch anything at all. And that would be a shame because, you know, think about some of the ideas you have in the back of your mind for things that you could build that would be genuinely helpful to people. So, for example, do you have a, an idea for a course that you are absolutely convinced would sell? but you haven't created it yet because you don't own professional video equipment and you aren't sure how to edit the videos. And so you think, ah, maybe I have to wait till I get much better equipment and much better skill with editing or whatever it may be. Well, would you believe me if I told you that my best selling course was created by recording a slideshow via Zoom which most of us know how to use at this point. I created slides. You could create slides with Canva. You could do that for free and then do a screen share on Zoom and turn that into a course. The, the course I'm referencing, it has no professional editing. I just edited it quickly on my computer and it looked sufficient to me. As a standalone product, it sells for $229 and I get good feedback about it all the time. Now, I'm the first one to admit it is not perfect. It is not the most polished. It is not the, the best thing I've ever seen in the world. And, uh, and, and I understand that, but I do know that it's helpful. And I do know that the content helps accomplish the goal that the course sets out to accomplish because I get feedback about it all the time. And it was just recorded with a screen share and some slides created with Canva or something similar. So I just want to throw that out there to you. And I didn't I didn't send it out to be professionally edited. I just edited it the best that I could myself with iMovie on my computer. Or how about this? Would you like to start a YouTube channel? I hear about this all the time. Someone was telling me about this earlier today in a conversation. Uh, but, you know, as you're thinking about starting a YouTube channel, you think, oh, maybe I'm not flashy enough to hold an audience's attention. Well, I have a friend, and I just found this out just a few days ago, but I have a friend who literally gets millions of downloads on his videos as he explains how to use Microsoft Excel. Now, I don't know if you think that sounds exciting. I don't think using Microsoft Excel sounds riveting. I don't think that sounds flashy. And by the way, if you knew my friend's personality, he is not somebody that is an outspoken um, you know, flashy in front of the camera type of person, but he knows how to use Microsoft Excel and he knows how to record a video of him of him doing that. I don't even think he shows his face on camera in his videos. And I looked and his his videos on on YouTube, I saw one that had 1.4 million downloads, another one had two and a half million downloads, another one was in the low three millions of downloads. His channels monetize. That's probably some good income for him at the same time. And there's nothing flashy about it. It's just him in front of his computer doing a screen share showing you how to use Microsoft Excel. And people love it. All right. How about this? Have you ever thought about starting a podcast, but you feel like, you know, maybe I don't have the best equipment or the best space to record? To record. Well, I, I was just a guest, and you could find this um, pretty easily through your podcast player, but I was just a guest on Sue Duffield's podcast. It's called Subiquitous, and she recorded her side of the interview from a clothing closet. Not a fancy studio as I was as we were recording. I could see her on the screen share and I saw shirts and coats and different things like that hanging in the background. She said, yeah, best audio I get in my entire home is in this clothing closet. And so I like to record here and I listen to how the audio of that show came out and it sounds fantastic. She doesn't have a glamorous space to record. She's just doing the best she can with what she has. And she's producing what I think is a fantastic product. So my encouragement to us is I use some of these examples from friends of mine. Don't let perfectionism hold you back from serving the people who need your help. And let me give you, you know, if you're listening to this and you're and you're struggling with perfectionism and you're saying, all right, that sounds well and good, but I don't know how to overcome my perfectionism. If that's you, if you're listening or if you're watching us on YouTube right now, I'd like to give you a few suggestions that I hope will help you overcome your perfectionism if it continues to be a lingering struggle for you. And I like to just share six real quick things, but these are things I think will genuinely help you 
if you're struggling with perfectionism. And I think it starts with setting some realistic goals. So that's hint number one or tip number one, set some realistic goals. And I think all that takes is just, you, you just take your larger tasks. So whatever it is, if it's building a course, starting a podcast, creating YouTube content, starting a coaching practice, whatever it may be, break your task, whatever the big task is, writing a book. Maybe that's the example in your life. Break it into, into smaller, more manageable steps and then focus on the progress that you're making uh, all along the way. So just keep making progress and don't worry about whether or not it's perfect. Don't whether don't worry about whether the book's perfect. Don't worry about whether the coaching practice or the website or whatever you're building is perfect. Just set realistic goals and then break that down into some smaller, more manageable steps. That's that's tip number one. Tip number two is this. And you'll see a theme with these. Aim for consistent action, not perfect results. This one is very, very big in my mind. This is, by the way, I think how I get stuff done. I aim for consistent action. I have certain things that I do on certain days of the week, and I don't consider my day done if I don't do those things on that day. So aim for consistent action, not perfect results. So tell yourself that your goal is to remain faithful to what you've committed to do. If I say I'm going to do something, I want to do it. So I got to stay faithful to what I've committed to do. I don't want to get der derailed by distractions, even the distractions of trying to make something perfect that can't be made perfect. So you just want to aim for consistent action, not perfect results. Number three, this is a biggie. And if you're a perfectionist, this one's going to be a tough pill to swallow, but I'm going to suggest it anyway. Give yourself permission to make mistakes. And another way I think I can phrase that that might be useful for some people is this. Don't tie your sense of worth to the way you think you'll be perceived in the eyes of others. There's some people that their whole sense of worth really comes down to being perceived as someone who doesn't make very many, if any, mistakes. But here's the thing. Everybody already knows you make mistakes. You're a human being. We all make mistakes, right? And understand that making mistakes and experiencing failures those are very normal parts of life. And when you look at the most successful entrepreneurs, you can find a whole list of mistakes that they made somewhere along the way. And the fact that they were able to bounce back from those mistakes in a healthy way typically propelled their success. It didn't hinder their success. So I think some of the most successful people are people that get over the emotional side of making mistakes rather quickly. Number four on my tip sheet is this. Adjust your standards for excellence, not perfection. So aim for excellence, aim for something that's good and valuable, but don't aim for perfect because that's not possible. So, uh, you know, another way I could say this is recognize that striving for excellence, it allows some room for improvement, but it also gives you the opportunity to appreciate your efforts and your accomplishments along the way. So aim for excellence. Look at something and say, you know, was this excellent? Was this the best that I could do in that moment? I heard John Maxwell say at one point, sometimes he'll go back and he'll look at some of his original books, and he's written a whole bunch of books now, and he'll look at some of the older ones and say, oh, I, I don't really like what I did with that one. And now he looks at it and he's like, you know what? I need to just say that's the best I could have done then. Yes, I can do better now, but I've written 50 books since then, right? Or 100 books since then. He's probably written 100. But the idea is aim for excellence, not perfection. The next thing you do is always going to be better than the thing you just did. So just keep leveling up. Aim for excellence. Don't try and be perfect. It's not possible. Here's another one that might be useful just from the mental standpoint. This is number five on my list. Break the cycle of overthinking. I am a classic overthinker in some areas of my life. Maybe you can identify with that. And I think perfectionists often get trapped in overthinking and excessive planning. I have a friend, he's a great planner, but he doesn't execute what he plans. But his plans are always perfect. He just doesn't carry through on anything. And I think perfectionists often get trapped in overthinking and excessive planning. And I think one of the ways that you could get over that, you could challenge that pattern by setting time limits for, for decision-making and then taking 
action sometimes, even when you maybe feel a little uncertain about what you're taking action on, still take the action anyway. Obviously, you know, major life decisions are going to take a little more planning than minor things. But what we're talking about here, we're not talking about life and death situations. We're talking about whether to launch a book in July or August. We're talking about whether or not, you know, to use blue or green as the background on your website. You know, that's what we're talking about. All right. Number six. This is uh, the last one on my list here. I could probably add more things to this list. So maybe this is an imperfect list, but it's some of the things that, that came to my mind this week as I was preparing for our podcast today. And that's this, make yourself publicly accountable for outcomes. And uh, and and the way I, I like to do this, we were even joking about some ways to do this uh, with our members club just a few minutes ago, but um, let others know what you're going to release and uh, and 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 what it's going to be, you know, whatever whatever project you're working on, let them know that you're going to release it at a certain time in and and commit to releasing it in whatever state of development it's in. On a certain date, stick to that date, you know, just commit to that. Say, all right, wherever it is, however far I am into this course, however far I am into this book, or whatever whatever you're working on, that you're going to make it public on a certain date even if it's in an imperfect state. And if you make yourself accountable to others, one of the things that some of us in platform launchers have done is we've pledged, I will give this amount of money to so-and-so if I don't make this public on a certain date. A few months ago, Jennifer Harshman was editing a book for me and she was waiting for a manuscript. It's very hard to edit a manuscript if the person writing it doesn't give you the manuscript, right? And so I said, you're all right, you know, I'm going to have that manuscript to you by this date. And if I don't give it to you on this date, I have to give you, and I can't remember what I said, like a thousand bucks or something like that. I said I was going to give her. And I knew like my integrity said, if I don't turn this in, I'm going to have to pay that thousand bucks. Well, I don't want to have to pay a thousand bucks just because I was tardy. So I think sometimes it helps to set a date, set a time, make yourself accountable publicly to other people with some sort of consequence, whatever it may be, that you're going to release something, even if it's in a messy state. And um, and it tends to help motivate you. It tends to help motivate me, particularly if I make myself publicly accountable for some of those outcomes and I put a date on it. And the funny thing is, if you release something messy and it's out there publicly, I know for me, it motivates me to fix it quicker once I know people can see it and use it, I actually get this burst of energy like, oh, no, people are looking at it and it still looks messy or I didn't finish this part of it. And somehow I get it done way quicker once eyes are already on it. So here's the thing, you know, just to sum this all up, I think many of us struggle with perfectionism in one area or another and even the process of overcoming perfectionism it's a it's a process that takes time and it, it takes some practice i hope some of these suggestions that i listed here are helpful to you but i'll tell you be patient with yourself celebrate progress that you make along the way and don't be afraid to release something even if it's kind of messy it's okay if it's kind of messy you can do something with it that is uh, that's amazing. You could help people if it just gets out there. But if you keep it to yourself because it's not perfect yet, you're robbing yourself of the opportunity to bless the people that it was meant for in the first place. Now, before we finish up this week, I want to invite you to take advantage of several things that we have available at platformlaunchers.com. One of the things that we make available for free is our 21-day platform development planning guide. And again, you could download that at platformlaunchers.com. It's right on the homepage. And I'd encourage you to do that if you're trying to figure out what your platform should be about and how you can deliver the content that'll be in that platform and how you can even derive an income from your platform. Download that planning guide. I think it's going to help you get that figured out. It'll certainly help you get your thoughts organized so you know what to do after that. And uh, something else I'll let you know about, and I've mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. We also welcome just guests and visitors to join us for our members club. And we give you a 14 day free test drive where you can test drive the members club and see if you like it. And if you join the members club, what you gain is access to all hundreds of hours of, of information and training that we have available on the website that'll teach you all the different aspects of online platform development from coming up with your idea to monetizing your idea, to delivering your content far and wide. 
You'll also see inspiration from other members and what they've done, and you'll be invited to the live groups where you can have accountability and where you can have conversation with others and hear about the ways that they've been winning in their platform. It's a lot of fun. So if you ever want to take a test drive of our members club, just go to platformlaunchers.com and it's free for 14 days. And if you want to be a long-term member, we certainly welcome that. But if you just want to take it for a test drive for two weeks and gain a bunch of information and make some new friends in the process, do that as well. We're just happy to meet you. And uh, again, all of it at platformlaunchers.com. Please check it out. But that's it for us this week. Thank you again for spending some time with us. We're always grateful to have you with us. We look forward to catching up with you again right here again next week. And in the meantime, we hope you have a wonderful seven-day stretch until we chat again. Take care.